This video is sponsored by Longevity Technology. So hello and welcome to the Shiki Science Show, where in this video we are going to talk all about the circadian rhythm and its association with aging. So first we'll cover what is the circadian rhythm and what it does. We'll then look at clock dysfunction and studies linking this with shorter lifespan and different diseases in muscle organisms. And then we'll see how there is crosstalk between the core clock components and the so-called longevity genes. And then lastly, we'll have a brief look at how we can use this information for so-called circadian medicine, which exploits our knowledge of the circadian rhythms to be able to improve the efficacy of different interventions, but also to reduce side effects. So first then, what actually is the circadian rhythm? Well, as suggested by its name, circadian, coming from the Latin, about a day, circadian rhythms are around 24-hour cycles that controls daily fluctuations in behaviour, physiology, metabolism and cell activity. I say the circadian rhythm is an evolutionarily conserved mechanism that enables organisms to be able to adapt to their surrounding environments and to synchronise their internal processes with environmental timing cues and this helps to ensure optimal organismal survival. And so for something to be considered circadian, it must meet three different criteria. Firstly, the rhythm must have an endogenous free running period that lasts approximately 24 hours. So that's basically the idea that the circadian rhythms are endogenous, they're within us, they're not coming from the outside. And so in the absence of environmental cues, it would maintain that around 24 hour period. And that's the other reason why it's called circadian, and that it's not exactly 24 hours, because if you take mice and leave them in constant conditions, so without light and day transitions, their daily activity advances with each passing day, because their circadian rhythm is around 23.7 hours, so it's slightly shorter than 24. The second criteria is that the rhythms are untrainable, and so that means that they can be reset by external stimuli. For example, if I was able, I guess, to be able to travel to America at the moment, I would experience some jet lag, but my body would be able to reset the circadian rhythm due to entrainment by the sunlight differences. And then lastly, the rhythms must exhibit temperature compensation. And so that basically means that the rhythm doesn't increase in speed if it gets hotter or decrease in speed when it gets colder, which could be pretty bad if you're living in the UK. And well, the reason it would be bad is because circadian rhythms allow organisms to anticipate and prepare for precise and regular environmental changes. So it's really useful for us to survive. And that's probably the most important thing to remember so far. And so the central clock that can be entrained by changes in sunlight is found in the hypothalamus in a region known as the suprachiasmatic nucleus, or SEN. And this central clock synchronises the peripheral clocks that are found in all of our other tissues. However, these peripheral clocks are also cell autonomous. They can run these rhythms without signals from the SEN. And how this is achieved in these different cells is by a very clever biochemical feedback loop. And to understand how the circadian rhythm is connected to ageing, I'll need to cover the four key components of this feedback loop so that everything makes sense. So, as I said, there are four key components, so-called clock, BMAR1, cryptochrome and period. And so clock and BMAR1 are both transcription factors. They bind to DNA and regulate the expression of different genes. And they do this by dimerizing together and binding DNA. Out of the different genes that they upregulate, two of them are cryptochrome and period. And so cryptochrome and period get expressed and translated in the cytoplasm, but then they come back into the nucleus, where together those two can dimerize and interact and repress the activity of clock and BMR1. And so by repressing the activity of clock and BMR1, they also repress their own gene expression. And so if they're not being expressed, then you remove that negative repression on clock and BMR1. And so you can see that there's this negative feedback loop. And the timing of which this negative feedback loop occurs enables this 24 hour cycle to occur. And well, it's a little bit, well, quite a bit more complicated than that, but it should be enough for you to follow the rest of the video and understand how the circadian rhythm is connected to aging. And so the first observations are the fact that circadian rhythms have been shown to decrease in amplitude with normal aging and at times also exhibit a shift in phase. 
And it's also been shown that mismatches between internal clocks and daily changes in the environment is detrimental to survival. And this has been shown experimentally in mice. As mice with free running periods of around 24 hours live 20% longer than mice whose periods deviate significantly from 24 hours. Moreover, mice that are deficient in one of the core clock components, BMAL1, not only live shorter but also seem to age faster and show features such as sarcopenia, cataracts and impaired hair growth. And so that's from the genetic level, but also manipulating the environmental light and dark cues can also influence lifespan in mice, as when mice were artificially exposed to a short day or 4 hours of light, 4 hours of dark, as compared to the 12 hour light, 12 hour dark, it reduced the lifespan of the mice. So these studies reinforce a clear connection between circadian dysfunction and aging. And this is further reinforced by a pretty cool study that showed that restoration of the circadian rhythm extended lifespan. For example, transplantation of the fetal SEN into aged animals increased their rhythmicity and extended their lifespan. Supporting that interventions that restore proper circadian rhythmicity could have anti-aging potential. But how exactly aging perturbs the function of internal clocks remains an open question. But one area where we may get some insight is from the crosstalk between the clock components and the so-called longevity signalling pathways. And so these signalling pathways include maybe some familiar factors such as mTOR, sirtuins, AMP kinase, and insulin signaling. And as suggested by the word crosstalk, the interaction seems to go both ways. Firstly, the genes that encode the components of these longevity signaling pathways show in different tissues circadian rhythmicity. Whilst they might not be rhythmically expressed in all tissues, the majority of these factors, which you can see nicely in this figure here, do show some rhythmicity in different tissues. And so, for example, you can see a lot of rhythmicity in these different genes in the heart and the liver. And another gene that shows rhythmic expression is the gene NAMPT, or NAMPT. And this encodes an enzyme that converts NMN into NAD+, with NAMPT being the rate-limiting enzyme in NAD+, biosynthesis, and while NAD+, being involved in many metabolic processes, but also being used as a cofactor for different enzymes, which I spoke more about in an entire video on NAD+, and ageing. And so for these reasons, NAD plus levels also oscillate during the day. But the interesting thing is that these different longevity signaling factors also feed back onto the core clock components. Firstly, AMP kinase has been shown to phosphorylate cryptochrome and that is thought to be involved in the degradation of cryptochrome, which would therefore alleviate the repression on clock and BMAL1. Moreover, the NAD plus dependent enzyme, sirtuin 1, directly binds to clock and BMAL1 and rhythmically deacetylates them, so it removes an acetyl group from them, and also promotes degradation of periods. I say so this also helps to maintain a robust circadian rhythm. And so these are just a couple of ways of the growing, expanding knowledge of how these two pathways cross talk to each other. And so this raises interesting questions, therefore, about so-called circadian medicine, whether we can exploit this knowledge to time interventions such that they have most bang for their buck, so to speak, by having the greatest efficacy whilst reducing side effects. And so to reiterate three key points from this video so far, we know that circadian rhythms seem to decline with age. And we also know that disruption of circadian rhythms can lead to metabolic disorders and that restoring circadian rhythms can promote health and longevity. Also, we know that aging related pathways oscillate through the day. So it would seem that there could be some logic to identifying strategies that can enhance the circadian rhythm and or have implications for the time of day when interventions are taken. Now, this is not necessarily going to be trivial to achieve, mainly because there are other considerations to take into account. Firstly, this includes the pharmacokinetics of the drugs, so that's how they're metabolised by the body. Secondly, tissue-specific pathways on top of the circadian rhythm could also implicate how the drugs are processed. And then lastly, there could be potential sex-dependent differences and also other unknown factors. So what additional information would we need to be able to address and act upon some of this information? Well, like how you can get an epigenetic test that looks at DNA methylation patterns to give you a kind of biological age. It would also be kind of interesting to have measurements of a so-called physiological time, which builds upon the point that 
in the 24 hour cycle, there's going to be a specific constellation of rhythmic genes being expressed. And then you can use that information to tell the kind of physiological time from a single sample to know whereabouts in the 24 hour rhythm you are. And then this could be used to improve diagnosis of circadian disorders, but also optimize the delivery time of therapeutic treatments. And interestingly, there's already been some work looking into this. For example, there's one algorithm that's been developed called time signature that can infer circadian time from gene expression in human blood. And there's also a preprint for something called time teller, again using transcriptomic data. And so I think all of this work is pretty cool, especially as there is so much you can infer from data, especially if you have multiple time points. And obviously how scalable these approaches will be will depend on what kind of measurements are needed and where those measurements can be taken from, if it's from blood samples, from cheek swabs or from hair samples. As obviously that will depend on how many time points you can get. And obviously the more time points you get for something like the circadian rhythm, that could be even more beneficial. As you could also then include things like the amplitudes and phase shifts in the algorithms. But another thing to take into account into these so-called physiological time signatures is that they may only tell you about dysfunction in local tissue, but not whole body synchronization. But all in all, these are definitely steps in the right direction. And with further understanding of the molecular underpinnings and the entrainment of circadian clocks in different tissues could definitely help identify further anti-aging interventions, which could be especially important for those more at risk, such as shift workers. So with that, I'd like to thank the sponsor for this week's video, Longevity Technology, for which I'm very grateful. Longevity Technology delivers high quality daily news and insights on research investments and technologies that extend health span and lifespan. Find the link to their website in the description. So I hope you've learned something in this video and more about circadian rhythms. So I'd just like to say thank you to my Patreon supporters and thank you for listening.